Uh, I'm Bodrock of the Dubonny Tribe and I'm here with the uh, Vicus Reenactment Group. We do Iron Age Romans and Britons, uh, Claudius invasion of Britain. Um, I'm dressed as a uh, British chieftain and this is the top of what they would be armed with. Uh, it's an incredibly expensive kit. We talk about chainmail with nice shoulder doubling, a sword, a helmet, a single handed spear and a nice long shield. Uh, it's incredibly expensive and this would be what the highest status Britain would be dressed as. You have to bear in mind I'm paying someone for six months of their life to make me a shirt like this. That's the wealth we're talking about. The sword will take several months to make and it uses an immense amount of iron to do so and skill. So to be dressed like this makes me the big man in society. When we deal with Britons on the field we'll talk about one in every thousand being armed and armoured like this. As opposed to the auxilia of the Romans which will be armed exactly like this and there will be a thousand of them uh, so your shield is made of as opposed to Roman because we, we talked to Romans last year so yeah so the uh, British shield there would be there's a whole variety and um, this is actually a continental shield this octagonal shape um, this shield here is more in line with what the British shields would be like they tend to be a lot smaller and they're more, almost more for duelling. Um, all variety of shapes, uh, again, lots smaller, personal combat, and that's what the Britons are doing, and the Celtic peoples generally. It's all about personal glory. Whereas the Romans, their scutums, they're a lot more bowed, they give you far more protection, and they work well in a unit. Spears look quite short. <laughs> no offence. <laughs> well, the spears, we find evidence that the spears could be up to about eight foot, and that's about as when it starts becoming a bit difficult to use single hand. Handedly. The idea of using two-handed spears is great, nice and easy, but you have to bear in mind we're having javelins, pelum, sling stones, arrows thrown at us. The Hollywood isn't. So, so if you don't alive. go with a shield... Stay alive in a battlefield. In a battlefield you need a shield. And Always you want to hold on to your spear. Shield. That's a spear that you hold on to. That's like one you that you throw. hold on. No, no. Yeah, no. right, okay, right. It's a fighting spear. You'll be fighting with single-handed, coming from above. They're very useful things. Oh. And quite often they do have nice long slashing blades, which do allow you to cut quite effectively. Or do they this. can have smaller Up ones. Over. Any cut from this and you're going to be disabled. <laughs> it's, if it just if it slashes you, it'll take out all yeah, your tendons and all here, your muscles. Right, yeah. Anywhere there's unarmoured, we'll go for it. And it's, it's like a very, very sharp dagger on a very long pole. And all we want to do is, it's not about killing you it's about getting rid of you or kill you once you're down on the ground but if I can cut your arm off I can slash you a lot it's of a the very warfare, vicious weapon a lot of the warfare with the uh, Celtic people and Britons it, again as we said it's not necessarily about killing you it's making you injured so you don't can't fight anymore but it's not just that it's about injuring enough of you so the rest of you no longer want to fight. If we injure enough of you and stop enough of you, then the rest of you will give up and run off. We want personal glory, we want to kill people, we want to go home with heads on our belts. Yeah, but at the same it. time, if we are going to lose, we know when to run away and come back and fight another day. They would carry heads with that. And there's scan evidence, there's evidence of heads being set into walls of houses and uh, archways, perhaps religious archways or whatnot, but um, in Belgium there's shrunken heads that have gone through a whole process of shrinking them down that would have been attached onto a belt. Oh, it's veneration though, you have to understand, it's, it's, look at me, look, they, I've, they, I've killed these very important people, therefore look at, look at yeah. how important I am. It's suggested that the soul of the enemy resides in the head, so if you take the head you've kept their soul and you now own them and you, it's this, that stance, you, your power over them, you now own their soul. Firm believers in the afterlife. Yes. There's no fear going into battle. We go into battle knowing that there is an afterlife. So if you die well, you go through. Which was called what? Like the... I don't know, we don't know what the afterlife is. We don't know because I never wrote it down. <laughs> it's so one, one downside of Celtic society is that it was in fact the Druids were forbidden to write down the, the anything. So it was all oral yeah. and overwritten by the Romans. All you hear now is Roman propaganda. Everything that we know about them that hasn't been you know dug up out of the ground, frankly, is Roman propaganda. This idea of Druids in you know white robes with golden sickles, it's Roman propaganda. It was the Romans that you know murdered and butchered people, not the Celts. There was there was no capital punishment in Celtic society. Society. didn't exist. They might send the odd people, so you see the bog bodies, but they were messengers to the gods. They weren't being, you know, they were ritually killed. Three deaths. It's a ritual killing. You know, so it's, it's Roman propaganda, all of it. Let me take my uh, cloak off, perhaps. The uh, Romans were very good at copying other cultures. So this chainmail 
It's a Celtic invention. They've been ha they had it for the best part of 1500 years or a few years before the Romans. And they come and they, the Romans see this doubling style, this second layer on the armour. And they like that. They say, yeah, that's very good and defensive against the sword blows. And they copy it and they adapt it and make it better. Same with the helmet. Uh, over here, the helmet there is very similar to what's called a Gallic type helmet and the Romans come and see it, they like it, and then they adapt it and make it better. They cut ear holes so you can hear orders. They add runes to it to protect it from sword blows. The sword here is typical of a uh, anthropomorph what we call an anthropomorphic sword. It's basically so, got so a So the Celts were the first top. ones to use chainmail? Yeah. yeah. Even Caesar ex accepts that they, they were actually the inventors of it. He actually specifies that the Helvetii, the modern day, from modern day Switzerland, yeah. were the, in, the people who invented it first. I never knew that. <laughs> yeah. They were the great iron workers of Northern Europe. Yes, they were, absolutely. Yeah. Like from Spain, they well, I mean, it's the, the thing with the Romans is they weren't too proud to admit when they come across something good. When you even have the, even the catapults, they, they use those from the Greeks. You know, it's... So when they come across something useful, something good, they do go, we can use some of that. Copy it, adjust it, make it better. Again, with the helmets, they start cutting out ear holes so you can hear orders from your centurions. They add a neck guard at the back to protect you from a downward slash. So the Romans had like a padding underneath. Have you got that under yours? Like a... uh, I've only got a tunic underneath there. We haven't found any uh, evidence underneath chainmail for any leather padding. Um, so Not leather, probably just extra layers of tunics. Does it another well. tunic or so? Yes. I mean, d judging by how dirty this chainmail makes my tunic, I wouldn't want to wear my nice, expensive one underneath it, personally. <laughs> and your sword? One more time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so chain one more time. <laughs> yes, the sword uh, its an anthropomorphic hilt, so it's uh, shaped on a human body. Um, there's several of these found, but coming towards the Claudian invasion, they seem to be phasing out in the uh, archaeological finds at any rate. Um, typically, if you're in a uh, northern area of Britain, the short is generally shorter. Southern, they're much longer, and there's only been one variation of each found north and south. But that's probably, and most likely, a uh, financial difference. Down in Kent, down in southern Britain, the tribes are generally a lot more wealthy. Up north again, as it generally has been throughout history, uh, the wealth is a lot less. But also there's per chance, as the swords develop and come longer, it's actually coming along perhaps with cavalry fighting and fighting from chariots. You need a longer sword or something like that to actually reach down. That's generally what drives longer swords in society. And it's made of... Uh, at the bronze? time it would be iron. 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 This handle is bronze. Um, the scabbard on the front is bronze. We've got iron back and the sword would be iron as well. Uh, there's um, a lot of conjecture as to how good the British swords were. Uh, there's sources that suggest that many of them had to retire mid-battle to stamp their blades flat again because they were bending. Yet, almost, uh, pretty much all the archaeological finds of swords in Britain, structurally, they're sound. And they shouldn't bend, they should work and function brilliantly. So uh, we're a bit unsure, perhaps they might have seen the decommissioning of swords. Yeah, the original so, deposition in rivers and lakes, all the weapons are broken, deliberately broken. No. You've got no sword at all? No, I wouldn't be well off enough to. Oh. My grandfather gave me this. This, I'm just a farmer. And I'm pretty I'm sure you've stolen that tool. And I probably stole it off somebody else here. Yeah. No. Yep. So, uh, stripping the dead at the end of a battle would be important then? Um, yes, it's... Uh, we do always wonder that why, if the Romans had better armour and better weapons, didn't the Brits strip their armour and use it? Quite frankly, you kill your enemy, you take their armour and their weapons, and you throw it in a river to the gods. It's brilliant for archaeology, because it means we find things like that. But, okay, it doesn't help them on a uh, military perspective. You'd think that, wouldn't you? But the, the helmets, because they would have been very similar. It was a, it, it's, you know, beyond the shield, it's the best piece of protection that you can have on the battle shield. So you wouldn't understand how the lorica worked. You might understand how the chainmail worked, but that would go to the big man, and he would then hand it out to his followers. You know, you get the, the hero's portion given out. Shall so, it all come out? It does indeed. <laughs> 
It's actually very dirty at the moment. <laughs> but it's a very short one. This is uh, more of a northern one. I have I've, uh, spent more money on my chain mail than my uh, sword. <laughs> but it will work just as well. There's a perhaps the chance that it's a weapon of last resort as well, uh, as it is so expensive. Um, rather use a spear, and perhaps if the spear gets lodged in someone or breaks, I might switch to my sword then. As a big man, though, on the battlefield, it's likely it's not that he's come onto the field on a chariot. And it's talked about in the, in the um, Tacitus, isn't it, that, that the massed ranks of the British chariots turn up, thousand chariots turn up. Um, you'd have a, uh, the, the charioteer would be a very you know able uh, driver. He'd have weaponry of his own, you know, javelins and stuff. But he would bring the big man to the edge of the battlefield. You could dismount, fight, but then they'd wait just in case he got into trouble. If he was hard pressed, he could run back onto the chariot, rearm himself and go back out, or he could be whisked off to safety. They're very agile machines as well. They're not lumbering carts. They're designed for rough ground. They're, they're pulled by two very strong ponies and they can do a fair rapid rate over very rough terrain. You know? We're learning more and more about chariots all the time. We're, we're, again, this idea, you know, that they were lumbering old carts, they just weren't. You know, they were really, really good fighting platforms. But not like the Roman chariots. You see, watch Ben Hur, it's nothing like that at all. It's not what they were at all. It's like a fighting platform. You might throw javelins from it, but you, were, you, were, you wouldn't really be fighting for it because it's maneuverability they want. It gets you to the point, you jump out. It's like a modern day armoured personnel carrier. It gets the soldiers to the point of the battle safely, and then it sits there and waits to take them away again. That's what it's there for. What you have is you have the nobles uh, riding up on these chariots, throwing javelins into the ranks. They're trying to break up the ranks so they can hop off get into that gap, kill as many as they can and as they begin to the tide begins to turn against them they can jump back onto the chariot and Caesar records these chariots being able to do sharp turns up on steep hills without losing any speed um, they he mentions about the British warriors being able to leap onto the backs of the chariots while they're going at full speed yeah the drivers running up the shaft now we're doing cartwheels on the yokes of yeah. the uh, chariots showing off really they're, they're brilliantly designed things uh, from what we found they had a very good suspension system of an iron bar, nice little spring underneath that would have suited British terrain very well. Hmm. We've there are enough fairly there's a fair few written sources that suggest the Brits painted themselves. Now it's saying woad. We don't know whether it would be blue. I have a theory that perhaps it's copper oxide, which is a turquoisey colour, which would have been very uh, available, especially if you've got communities that work in bronze. All it is is oxidised bronze. You get a nice green turquoise colour. You can take that and very easily put it on. Likewise, there's also suggestions that they painted themselves with red. Well, again, you've got a community working with iron. You get iron oxide. And in fact, there's tribes in Africa still that paint their skin with iron oxide to keep the worst effects of the sun and heat off of them. Uh, Wode's also got an antiseptic thing, isn't it? So it may well be that it was you know, more, uh, a precursor to antibiotics. Any small cut, especially with this, if you dig the spear into dirt or you sort of dirt, it's full of bacteria, very lethal bacteria. If I cut you with it, if I don't kill you, you're going to go away and die over the next week or so of a very vicious disease. So, you know, if you paint yourself up with Wode, maybe that will help. That's part of the reason why you might fight semi-naked as well. If you get a cut and the fabric gets into the wound, the wound will fester. But if you've got nothing on top, we didn't fight naked. The last Celtic battle naked was Telamon in northern Italy in 233 BC where the, the Celtic tribes there were, were fairly well beaten by the That's Romans. The um, but it was a terror weapon, you know, come charging up naked. It, it worked quite often, yeah. but eventually the Romans got the hang of it and it didn't work anymore. But, but the Brits didn't fight naked, so, you know, I know that a lot of people think that we were savages. We weren't. We had a really fa fabulous law system. We had a, a, quite a, a illegalitarian society. Women were equal in our society. You know, we were just troublemakers in Europe. <laughs> we were very rich currently. We were very, very rich, very rich, very rich with rich resources. Yeah, yeah. And the Romans look at it, see we're trading with them, and then go, ah, why are we trading? Why don't we own it? Yeah. So we'd been sending help to the, the uprising. Uh, Vercingetorix's uprising in southern uh, Gaul. We'd been sending help to that. So we were, you know, and we were a refuge as well for a lot of discontent. Um, the, 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 the Druid philosophies were meant to have been coming out of Britain as well. You know, the, the talk about uh, Lim Kerrick back and, and the, the sacred groves in Anglesey, that was a, a big Druid school. They were all over 
but it kind of was stemmed out of this, this political philosophy that the Romans did not like was, was coming out of Britain. So there were plenty of reasons why they were going to come over and, and do us over eventually. Plus, Claudius needed a victory to secure himself in power. You know, he had a very tenuous hold on power. A victory, you know, pretty much secured his entire reign. So we're victims of really Roman politics and our own meddling in Europe. And guess what? We still meddle in Europe. <laughs> we're still the outsiders, aren't we? <laughs> Nothing changes. <laughs> That's true.